everybody. I'm Cassie, your Kids Ministry Director here at Grace Bible Church. We are so excited that you're joining us for Grace Bible Church online today. We have a couple of announcements for this week. You can sign up for new adult Bible studies by going to our website and clicking on the events tab. Uh, There are still a few ways that you can continue giving. That's through our website on the Give Online tab, through our app, or of course you can always mail that in. And we also want to stay connected with you and your family. Um, So be sure that you've liked and are following all of our Facebook pages. That's our Main Grace Facebook page, our Kids Ministry page, and our Student Ministry page. I think with technology, it's so cool that we're still able to worship and learn about God together, even though we can't physically be together. So thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy today's message. Uh, We'd like to welcome you to our Sunday morning service, and uh, and, uh, we just uh, invite you. Jesus. Um, And what I'd like to do is just take a moment right now to invite Jesus into uh, your homes and into this space. Jesus, we want you here. We want you in our homes. We want to glorify you and praise your name. Lord, this is for you. It's for your glory. We serve a God who is simply amazing. And that word just pales in description, but it's all we got. You are amazing, and you are the only one who is worthy to be praised.
glorify you, you bring us to life. Here we go.
Hello and welcome to uh, Grace Bible Church Online. Thank you so much uh, again for joining us. Uh, appreciate that. Um, if you want to be kept up to speed with all the announcements, um, you can text the code that you see there on the screen and what will happen is we'll have those announcements sent straight to your phone. Uh, that's probably the best surefire way that you're going to get all the announcements and all the events that are taking place. We've got some new Bible studies that are starting up that you can join online. And so all that information is going to be there uh, in that text that gets sent to you. And, uh, of course, we'll continue to send uh, all the information that we can uh, through Facebook and email and other communication means. But, like I said, texting is probably the best way to go. Uh, you know, as we uh, think through history, uh, there's all kinds of confrontations, there's all kinds of conflicts that take place. Uh, you know, when you think of these conflicts and confrontations, think like um, David and Goliath kind of stuff. Uh, maybe think about the Revolutionary War for us here in America, or uh, you think of World War II, you got the uh, uh, Allied powers versus the Axis powers, but, but also think of things like um, the uh, conflict between which is better, Coca-Cola or Pepsi, um, Mac versus PC, um, dog people versus cat people, or uh, DC Universe versus the Marvel, uh, Lakers, Celtics. Those are sports uh, conflicts and confrontations that take place. So uh, all of these are just simply examples, but here's the thing. It's important to understand that in these situations that you take a side because remaining indifferent is not an option. So about a month or so ago, uh, Brett Royal called me up and he said that he uh, was going to get some tickets to uh, attend the Texas A&M basketball game, men's basketball game, and uh, wanted to know whether or not I wanted to join him and, and it would be a great time to go up there, see our kids, uh, visit with them, go to the basketball game. And, and, I, and I said, of course. And you have to understand, though, that this created a dilemma for me because Texas A&M was playing the University of Kentucky. So here's my dilemma. On the one hand, I'm paying money uh, for my daughter who is a student at Texas A&M, but my parents are graduates of the University of Kentucky, and all of my life I have been a University of Kentucky basketball fan. So well, who am I going to cheer for and who am I going to root for? Mind you, the tickets were in the alumni section, so it's like, well, which way am I going to go? Well, it might have been a dilemma for some, but for me it was clear go big blue that's kind of the way I roll but for some of you maybe the rivalry um, for us here in Texas that me maybe uh, is more clear for you would be the rivalry between Texas A&M and University of Texas uh, you know you kind of look at these two different universities great universities but but when it comes to supporting them uh, you got one of three options either you're going to support Texas A&M or you're going to support University of Texas or you're going to be indifferent because you just don't care. Maybe, uh, you know, you go to TCU, you know, go Horn Frogs or, you know, Baylor Bears or, uh, you know, Texas Tech, I guess, Raiders. And I don't know, Rice is the Pirates. I don't know. Anyways, uh, you're, you're going to be indifferent. But, but you're not going to be able to cheer for both. Like, that's just not going to happen. You're not going to support both of these schools because that's just unnatural. That's like combining a bird with a bear. It's just not going to happen. So, so the point I'm trying to make is, is that when it comes to important things like this, it is important to know which side you're on. It's important to know which side you're on. So we're in this series called Don't Panic. Last Sunday, if you recall, 
Uh, we uh, looked at Elijah from 1 Kings chapter 17, and there was this confrontation that was brewing. Uh, you had the northern kingdom of Israel. They were worshiping the god of Baal, whose name means Lord. And then Elijah shows up on the scene, and his name means my god is Lord. So we've got this confrontation that's going on here. And, and so what Elijah does is he goes there to the northern kingdom of Israel and he confronts King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, two very, very evil kings or, or rulers. He had an evil king and his demon bride, Queen Jezebel. And, and so Elijah goes to them and he says, listen, there's going to be no rain until I say so. No rain. And so Elijah's prediction, you have to understand, was a total collapse of society that was built on agriculture. So no rain meant no crops, which meant no commerce, which meant no work. No rain meant no food. No rain also meant that Baal, who is the god of fertility and rain, well, he's a fraud. And so Elijah throws down the gauntlet. Either Elijah's god, Jehovah, was going to be victorious as evidenced by no rain. Or Ahab and Jezebel's god, Baal. He would be victorious by sending rain despite Elijah. One was going to be victorious, the other one was not, but both sides were not going to win. There was going to be a loser. So if you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18, as you turn there, we uh, left Elijah off there in 1 Kings 17. He was in Zarephath, which is in Phoenicia. Uh, Phoenicia happened to be the homeland of Queen Jezebel, and it was also the epicenter for Baal worship. Uh, But God was protecting and providing for Elijah. He was living there with a widow and her son. And uh, the entire time, like I said, God was taking care of them. So we're going to pick it up here in 1 Kings 18, verse 1. It says this, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, meaning that this famine didn't just simply affect the people there in the kingdom of Israel, it affected the entire region. So you got a lot of people here who are suffering and they've, they've hit the, the panic button, they're hurting. So verse three. Ahab then calls Obadiah, who was over the household, and gives this parenthetical notation here. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He was a believer in Jehovah. And when Jezebel cut off, cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and he hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So essentially what's going on here is that for the past three years or more, as this famine has continued to increase, so has Jezebel's anger. And her anger is partly due to the fact that there's just no rain. There's a lot of suffering that is going on, but part of her anger is because there's been no response by Baal whatsoever. You know, she's like crying out to Baal, come on, Baal, we need rain, and there's, there's nothing. But her anger is also uh, rising because people continue to align themselves to the God of Elijah, of whom she cannot stand. And so in her wrath, she's sending out her soldiers and uh, homes are being ransacked. People are being drug out and tortured and killed. Like, you know, kind of picture uh, occupied uh, Nazi uh, kind of uh, uh, time period where, uh, you know, you remember the, the book or the movie, uh, a Diary of Anne Frank, you know, people are hiding out and they're getting drug out and taken off to concentration camps and killed. And that, that's kind of the idea of what's going on here. In the middle of all this, God had put a mole, though, right underneath King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's noses. This guy's name's Obadiah. His job was to uh, to, to be the head household or head of the household there of the palace. He was kind of like the head servant. And so uh, he he kind of tracked all of the the supplies that were coming into the palace, and he would distribute things and make sure that people are being taken care of there within the palace. So he was kind of the head guy there, and what he was doing is he was taking a portion of the food and the supplies, and he had hidden away about a hundred prophets of God, of of Jehovah, and, and he hid them in a couple of caves, and he took care of them. He fed them there. But then one day, and, and you can kind of read it there further in the passage, King Ahab goes to Obadiah and he says, look, we're, we're in dire straits here and we need to look for this land and look for grass. And so he tells Obadiah, you go one way, I'll go the other way and, and we'll just see if there's any water, any grass that might be out there. And so 
He tells them this, and you've got to figure that, that things are really, really bad when you have the king looking for grass. Like, that's a bad place to be. So they split, they go the different way, and Obadiah, if you read in the passage, Obadiah runs into Elijah. And Elijah tells Obadiah, go back and tell King Ahab that I'm, I'm coming. And Obadiah kind of has a moment of panic here. He's, he's had a front row seat to Queen Jezebel's rage, and he's like, okay, hold on. If I go back and tell King Ahab that I saw you, but I didn't capture you or kill you, my neck is on the chopping block. And, and Elijah assures him, he says, don't worry, just tell King Ahab I'm, I'm on the way. And it says there in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, I've not troubled Israel, you have, and your father's house, because you abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. So you gotta understand there's this overwhelming perception there within the kingdom of Israel that Elijah was the one who was causing all the drought and the famine and all the suffering that Elijah was the one who was at fault, and so that's why they needed to go find him and capture him and kill him. But Elijah would have none of it. He looks at King Ahab and he goes, no, 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 no. He says, these people are suffering because of your blatant disobedience to the one true God, to Jehovah. You're in this sorry state because you're a sorry king who worships a sorry God. So all of this is on you, it ain't on me, it's all at your feet. Verse 19, now therefore, Send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. And Asherah was uh, the mistress goddess to Baal. And then notice this, who eat at Jezebel's table. In other words, while everybody else there in the kingdom of Israel was suffering under this famine, under this incredible drought, Queen Jezebel had these 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah into the palace to where she was providing for them and taking care of them and feeding them at her table. And this is the confrontation that we've all been waiting for. Elijah tells Ahab, meet me at Mount Carmel. And you can see in this picture here, this is modern day Mount Carmel. Uh, it's not a very high mountain. Um, on top of it is actually uh, kind of flat, so there's some room to, to be up there and to gather some people up there at the top. But what's key about Mount Carmel, Carmel, and this is where I think Elijah's being strategic, is where it's located geographically. So if you notice here on the map, uh, Mount Carmel is right here where Haifa is. It's right there on that border. And so it, it kind of served as a natural barrier between the Phoenicians and the kingdom of Israel. And it's right there in the middle. And, and Elijah says, meet me there so that all those who are there in Phoenicia, people who uh, worship Baal, it's the epicenter for Baal, as well as the people here in the kingdom of Israel, they will clearly see what is going on. And then he tells King Ahab, he says, listen, you can bring whoever you want. You can bring as many soldiers as you want. It doesn't matter to me. Just make sure that the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah make sure that they are there. And so here we are, it's the showdown. It's kind of like this classic Western movie scene. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was watching The Pale Rider and Clint Eastwood, who's the preacher, and maybe that's why I like the movie so much. It's, it's the, the showdown between preacher and Stockburn right there at the end of the movie. That's, that's kind of the scene of what's going on here. And The showdown is here at Mount Carmel. And so it says everybody gathered there, and in verse 21, it says, Elijah came near to all the people, and he said to them, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And then notice this. The people did not answer him a word. So Elijah here, he, he gathers them together and he calls them out. And he calls them out because throughout this entire ordeal, from the moment where Elijah said there's gonna be no rain, the people of Israel remained undecided they couldn't make up their mind as to which side they were going to take they were hedging their bets they were playing it safe it's kind of like on the one hand they were thinking to themselves well team Jehovah Elijah's God he seems to have the upper hand there's been no rain but if I support team Jehovah well then the captain of team Baal Queen Jezebel she's going to kill me on the spot so so instead of kind of deciding on which team I'm going to go with I, I'm just going to wait this thing out I'm gonna ultimately see who wins 
And then whoever's the victor, I'm going to jump on that bandwagon. It's kind of like that person in the office who could really care less about the San Antonio Spurs. And then all of a sudden it's like they win the championship and the next day that person in the office shows up with like the San Antonio Spurs championship t-shirt and, and you're just like, really? That, that's kind of what Elijah's confronting here. And he's calling them to choose. He's saying, if you believe that Jehovah is Lord, then follow him. But if you think that Baal is Lord, well then follow him. You got to choose because right now you're limping between two different opposing opinions. You can't support both teams. You can't have it both ways. You got to go all in with one or you got to go all in with the other. And ultimately, what Elijah is asking of them is kind of what he asks of us too. And the question is this Who do I serve? Who do I serve? You see, whether you like it or not, we're all relying on something or someone. We're all trusting in something or someone. We're all serving something or someone. And the question on the table is simply this, who or what is that? Is it God or is it a substitute for God? Or worse, are you trying to have it both ways? You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, finish the sentence. Do I serve God and fill in the blank. The Bible has a very clear example. Do I serve God and money? Do I serve God and money? Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Do I serve God and people's approval? It's like on the one hand, I know what God thinks of me, I know what God says of me, but I desperately need the approval of this person or that person for my sense of well-being. Do I serve God in the accumulation of possessions? Hoarding. I, there's nothing wrong with taking care of you and your family, uh, but the problem is, is that when you take more than what you need in order to gain a sense of self-control, in order to obtain a measure of confidence that you're provided for and you're protected, well, well, which is it? Do you believe that God is the one who's gonna provide and protect you or, or, or is it the accumulation of your possessions is what's gonna provide and protect for you? You can't have it both ways. And what Elijah is saying is, is that. He's just saying you gotta decide. So notice what he says there in verse 23. He says, let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you will call in the name of your God, I will call in the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken, we agree. Now this kind of begs the question, I was thinking about this, like why fire? Like, isn't the situation here a test of rain? Like, there's been no rain for all these years. Why not make it about rain? Why fire? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, Baal, um, he is the god of rain as well as of fertility. But whenever you see a little uh, statuette uh, that was made, a little idol of Baal, you always saw in one of his hands a lightning bolt. So Baal was kind of just the god of uh, storms, you know, so lightning, rain, all that kind of stuff. But, but here's the other reason why, and I think, I think um, Elijah's playing it smart here. Because if this test was just rain, then maybe somebody could have said, well, you know, there were some clouds out that day. Uh, you know, after all, it's been many years since we've had rain. I mean, we were due. I mean, rain is a natural occurring thing. I mean, who could really prove that rain came as a direct result of Elijah's prayer? I mean, like, what if... What if it was the result of the prophets of Baal and it just took some time for the cloud and the storm to get there? Maybe, maybe Elijah just kind of stepped up to the plate at the right time and he just got lucky. So what Elijah, I think, is doing here is his goal is he wants to make sure there is no mistake whatsoever as to who is the one true God. Verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare first, for you are many, 850 of you. Call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon. 
saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered and they limped around the altar that they had made. Notice this started from morning until noon. Morning in this culture was uh, anywhere from around six, seven o'clock in the morning till noon, 12. So we're, we're talking six hours later. Six hours of them dancing and crying out to Baal, answer us. Six hours this went on. I mean, I I can only imagine what Elijah was doing during that time. It's at this point that Elijah engages in the age-old tradition of trash-talking. Notice what it says in verse 27. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing deep in thought, or, or he's relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and he must be awakened. I mean, I mean he is just trash-talking. He's like, you know, this, this Baal God, you know, he, maybe he's old. He's been around a long time. Maybe he's hard of hearing. You got to shout a little bit louder. It says, literally, he says he's relieving himself. Like, like he's in the bathroom and, you know, he stepped up to the plate, but, you know, it's just not happening. I, it says he's on a journey. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's some people out there that are more faithful than you. Maybe he's kind of tending to them and you just got to cry out louder. Maybe he's asleep and, and you just got to arouse him and get him up. And so he's trash talking. I and mean, you kind of wonder, like, what is the point of trash talking? Well, it's, it's to kind of get into the head of your opponent. So notice what it says in verse 28. This is exactly what happened. It says, They cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of oblation. And the offering of oblation is at twilight. And so this goes on for another four to five more hours. The prophets of Baal desperately pleaded for Baal to show up to bring the fire. And as their custom, they, they started cutting themselves a store, they, lancing themselves. And this became this, this very gross, very gory, sickening scene very, very quickly. And what was Baal's response? says there were no there was no voice no one answered no one paid attention kind of begs the question do you know how many people give themselves over to false gods only to end up hurt damaged and exhausted like millions of us there's another prophet by the name of jeremiah who said this in jeremiah 2 13 he says my people have committed two evils They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In this culture, if you needed water, you would either go to a river or a stream. Uh, You would go to a well, which was uh, just a really deep hole uh, that would go all the way down to a water table. The third option, the worst of them all, was a cistern. And a cistern um, was just kind of this large uh, basin holding tank if you will a lot of times it was built underground here's a a picture of one the side of it has kind of been cut out but really all a cistern would do is just collect runoff water and these cisterns they they would um, have a clay that would be put onto the walls to kind of cover up all the cracks but the problem with a cistern is that you didn't know if there were cracks in the clay until you went to go draw water and and there's nothing there that's the problem with cisterns. And, and Jeremiah is just calling it out. He's saying, this is the problem. They, the people have forsaken me and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And in so many ways and at many times, 
Is, is this not just simply a picture of us and our lives? Have we not all at, at some point invested in something that couldn't hold water? Again, for the past couple of weeks, we've seen that the cistern of money has got some cracks. For some, that, that cistern is getting pretty empty. For others, the cistern of acceptance from other people is where we go after, but then we, we, we drop the, the bucket in, so to speak, and we find out that the people disappoint and they let us down. And so we're left feeling empty. For some, the cistern is beauty, but beauty is fleeting. There's all kinds of cisterns that we go to for meaning and purpose and fulfillment and security in life, only to discover that it's never enough, or they're never enough, or maybe I'm not enough. And we keep going back to that broken cistern, only to find ourselves thirstier and thirstier. Another prophet of God would put it this way in 1 Samuel 12, 21. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. It doesn't take a genius to know that when a person invests into something and gets zero return on their investment, that that's a bad investment. And yet, you and I do it every day. We pour our time, we pour our energy, affection into all kinds of things and all kinds of people, demanding a return on our investment only to discover that they won't because they can't. See, the truth is, is that we cannot expect anything or anyone to provide that which only God can give. We cannot expect anyone or anything to provide that which only God can give. Why? Because that thing or that person is not God. They were not created to bear such weight. He will never be able to fill your love tank like only God can. She will never be able to fulfill all of your needs like only God can. That thing is never ultimately going to satisfy you, satisfy you in the way in which only God can. A God who, by the way, has not ever said once, you just need to try harder to achieve my love or you need to work harder to gain my grace or you just need to be more in order to get more. Not once has God ever asked us for such things. The only thing that God has ever asked of us is simply this, surrender. Surrender. God, I can't save myself, only you can. God, I can't provide and protect myself, only you can. God, I can't heal and restore and fix my broken life, but you can, so I surrender myself to you. I mean, isn't that what makes this scene here on Mount Carmel so terrifying and so sad? Terrifying in the sense to see the, the horrible things that people will do to themselves. Sad to see the extent that people will go regardless of the pain and the suffering that it causes all in pursuit of gaining something from anything that's ultimately empty, void, and will fail. Terrifying and sad for them back then, terrifying and sad for millions of us today. Terrifying to see what people will do in pursuit of more. Sad to see what broken, sinful people will do to be accepted and loved by other broken and sinful people. It's at this point that we see in this passage here in 1 Kings 18, we come to Elijah's turn. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he prepared the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. So in the midst of the, the Baal worshipers, they had knocked it down, just kind of you know, angry. Maybe that was what was holding Baal up. I don't know. So Elijah, he builds it back up. He takes 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your, your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two sayas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And then he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. Elijah puts a demand upon himself that he didn't put upon the prophets of Baal. He has water poured all over his altar to the point where the wood is thoroughly saturated. 
And what Elijah is doing here is he wants to make sure there's no shadow of doubt, not just simply as to what was about to happen, but who was going to make it happen. Verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, so again, this is twilight. You know, it's, it's dusk. Um, here you are on a high mountain at Mount Carmel. Uh, you can see from a, a, a long way. It's dusk, and, and the fireworks are just about to begin. It says, Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones, the stones like melted and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And then notice this, verse 39. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord is, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Can you just hear it? It just continues to go on. And as it goes on, the Lord, he is God. What you're hearing is el e el e Elijah. And so on that day, God's goals were accomplished. God's glory was exalted as the one and only true God. And the hearts of his people were turned back to him. No longer were they limping between two gods, two differing opinions. And then just to kind of close the story up here in verse 41, Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. It's kind of been a long day. There's been this, there is the sound of rushing rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed himself down to the earth, put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again. And he said this seven different times. On the seventh time, the servant said, behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. So he's looking out there in the distance and he says, "Eh, it's about the size of my hand. It's not very big. And then it says there, um, he says at that seventh time, he says, go up and then say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Uh, Elijah outruns this chariot of Ahab. And that's kind of the end of the story. I mean, you think about it again. God's glory is exalted. He's exalted as the one true God. And all this rain, this rain that hasn't been there for years. I mean, can you imagine if you're the people? Can you imagine what that must have been like on that, just to see the rain just pouring down, just the excitement, the exuberance, the joy of the fact that that finally life is coming back to this land. And think of all the different things that Elijah happened to see at this point in his life over these last few years. I mean, he had seen God stop the rain. He's seen God protect and provide for Elijah. He's seen God raise a dead boy back to life. He's seen God bring down fire from heaven. He's seen God send rain. And now he has seen God turn the hearts of the people back to him. Again, God was glorified. And the rain was restored to the land. And the people had joy. I think there's something that can be learned here. The more that we exalt God, the more our joy rises. The more we exalt God, the more our joy rises. The more we make of God, the more we experience joy in life. For God is always about his glory for our good. But for the one who remains undecided between the two teams, there's no joy. Because regardless of who wins, there's no joy for the undecided. But for the one who has picked a team, when their team wins, there's great joy. I mean, see how all this works? See, God is all about securing our joy, but not at the expense of his glory. However, when we go all in for his glory, when we surrender to him, when we follow him, trusting that he's going to provide, he's going to protect, it is then that our joy increases, even despite our circumstances. 
So for the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, we've all been to the grocery store, been to HEB, and we've all kind of gone in there, and we've seen at times the shelves be empty. And I'm going to be honest with you, there have been times where that's frustrated me, at times where um, I even had a moment of anxiety, like, what am I going to do? How am I going to take care of my family here? You know, we've all had to kind of cobble together meals just to kind of make it work. And it kind of hit me that there was one day I was in the HEB and, and um, you know, it was that time when there was just like no, no chicken. There was, I, and I, there was like six packages of chicken left. And in that moment, I thought to myself, I better grab them all. I better get them all because I don't know if there's going to be anything there tomorrow. I only needed two, but I thought I'm just going to take them all. And, and as that thought kind of crossed my mind, it was like God goes, hey, wait a minute. You, you just preached on this one. You can't do that. That's, that's, that's taking more than what you need. And so in that moment, I was like, okay, God, you're right. I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of me. And I just took two, two little things of chicken. And, and as I've kind of thought back and as I've reflected over this last couple of weeks, our family has been taken care of. I mean, we're eating meals that maybe we wouldn't necessarily eat in our normal schedule. But God has taken care of us. And it's just a very simple, small example, but, but I can look at that and think, that, that brings me great joy. I, I tried to honor God and submit to him and trust that he was going to provide and take care of me, and he has. And it's brought great joy. That God has been so good for us. You see, God is all about securing our joy, but only when we pick a side and we follow hard after him. So, Here's some closing applications, things that we can kind of walk away with. Here's the first thing. Number one, take an inventory of how you've seen God work in your life lately. Take an inventory of how you've seen God work in your life lately. Like literally, sit down, make a list. You can do it on your own. Maybe do it together as a family. Talk about it with each other. For some of us, for some of us, we need to be reminded of who God is. God is love. He loves me forever. God is strong. He is all knowing. God is my rock. He is my salvation. We will not be shaken. God is. Um, we pray to Him. God is my provider. God is my superhero. God is my peace in the chaos. God is my healer. God is so much. God is so nice that he probably made this walk thousands of years ago just for me to see it. God never changes. God is always present. God is faithful. God is patient. <laughs> God is the great physician. God is perfect. God is perfect. God is omniscient. God is grateful. God is my savior. God is powerful. God is strong. Okay, Landon, what is God to you? Um, he is powerful. Brayden, what is God to you? God is my best friend. Sissy, what is God to you? God is my everybody. God is my savior. God is holy. God is powerful. God is brave when he died on the cross for our sins. God is in my heart. In that video, we had great uh, examples of uh, people just sharing about who God is. And I, I couldn't get all of the, uh, the, the examples on there. Uh, I had to kind of cut some so parents don't get mad at me. But uh, I thought those were just some great examples, reminders to us of who God is. Uh, this past week, uh, there's been a song that's been playing on the radio. It's called Graves to Gardens. And it's kind of been my, my worship song for the week. And would encourage you to uh, to listen to it. I'll, maybe I can post the video on this uh, on this video. If not, we'll we'll link it to our Facebook. But but the song it says, "I searched the world, but I but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. 
Oh, there is nothing better than you. There is nothing better than you, Lord. There is nothing better than you. It's a great song and a great reminder that God has been at work in our lives. Secondly, you need to honestly answer for yourself, who or what am I ultimately serving? You've got to be honest with yourself. Who or what am I ultimately serving? I mean, that's the question that's really at the heart of 1 Kings 18. Elijah said in verse 21, he called the people. He says, how long will you go limping along between two differing opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then by all means, follow him. You can't do both. You have to choose. It's either Elijah or Baal. It's either my God is Lord or, or it's anything or anyone else. Each of us have to choose. It's one side or the other, but you can't be for both. See, on the one side, you have Jesus. And Jesus says you simply are not gonna find a better deal than what I'm offering to you. Uh, let's face it, you cannot pay for all the things that you have done wrong. You cannot do enough good things to make up for the bad things you have done. You cannot buy your way into a relationship with me. You cannot secure your own joy. And so I paid the price for you. I secured your joy and your salvation. And these are things that I offer to you as a gift. It's called grace. All you need to do is surrender and take it by faith. On the other hand, there's anything and everything else which all ultimately boils down to you and me working really, really hard to be good enough. You and me exhausting ourselves for the approval of a God that doesn't exist. You and me spending ourselves trying to find satisfaction and joy through our own effort. You and me continuing to return to those broken cisterns for our parched souls, only to find them empty, causing us to hit the panic button. Those are our two choices. But for far too many of us, we've been limping along between two opinions. Instead of going all in, instead of surrendering to God and following hard after him, we've been hedging our bets, buying our time, playing both sides. And Elijah calls us to choose. As Christians, we serve a mighty God. We serve an awesome God. We serve a gracious, merciful, kind, and loving God. We serve a God who will never leave us, will never forsake us, a God who provides for us, who protects us, a God who is at work. He is at work in us, he is at work around us, and he is doing something for his glory and for our good. We serve a God who is with us, as Martin says, on the mountaintop as well as in the valley. We serve a God who is there in the fires of life with us. A God who says to us, follow me, because I think I'm worth following. Don't you think?
Hi Grace, this is Pastor Claude here. And just touching base real quickly with what Pastor Aaron shared today is that in great times of adversity, there are also great opportunities. So here's this week's challenge. We challenge you to connect with one of your neighbors and see how they're doing and see if there's a need. These are great opportunities to be at the hands and feet of Jesus so close to home. And during this time, it is a great opportunity to be able to do that. This week, we ask also that uh, you connect with them and if there's anything to be in prayer for them, that you would actually go ahead and do that as well too. So until next week, Lord bless and keep you.